Hi, everyone. Um, we'll give everybody uh, a couple extra minutes and then we'll start in a little bit. Thanks. Okay, why don't we go ahead and start. Um, thanks for everybody who is attending. Um, my name's Chris DeStash. Um, I think I probably know some of you. Um, and I'm gonna talk today um, about vancomycin, uh, pharmacokinetics, and how we can approach um, obtaining and individualizing therapy based on um, some pharmacokinetic principles, as well as some uh, patient characteristics. So um, we know that vancomycin is uh, an old drug, um, pretty large in terms of its molecular weight, um, and it's been around for a long time, and we still have um, a lot of difficulty trying to figure out how to appropriately dose the drug. And so we'll talk about some of those factors. In terms of um, spectrum of activity, um, this is probably the exact opposite of Aztrianam. Aztrianam is just a drug that covers only gram negatives. Uh, vancomycin only covers gram positives. And so um, Staph aureus, um, both MRSA as well as MSSA, although it's not as, not as good in terms of killing in, uh, as compared to beta-lactam agents. So for MSSA, if you have a, um, a, if you have a patient, it's best to use a beta-lactam for that organism. It can be used for enterococcus, um, unless you're dealing with a vancomycin um, resistant enterococcus. Um, and then orally, it can be used for Clostridium difficile. Um, it is bactericidal, although the mechanism of it um, inhibiting cell wall synthesis is, um, it takes a while. Um, and so um, some people, feel that it may not be as bactericidal as maybe some other um, drugs that are available. And so um, if you look at some of the different um, pharmacodynamic parameters, um, everyone um, knows that vancomycin is either based on trough concentrations, which is an indirect measure of um, AUC, or 
um, the newest um, vancomycin monitoring guidelines that will come out um, fairly soon will base it off of um, AUC over MIC. And so this is uh, an example of a um, in vitro time kill curve um, where basically um, the organism is either in a growth control phase um, for 96 hours. And so you basically start out at um, uh, about eight or nine times 10 to the, or, or 10 to the nine organisms. Um, and then you can see that uh, the growth control continues to go up. Um, vancomycin does kill MRSA, but um, if you notice, it only goes down to um, two um, colony forming units um, over 96 hours. So it's actually a fairly slow growing or slow killing or um, antibiotic. If you add genomycin to the media, uh, along with vancomycin, you can get a little bit better killing. Um, and that's what the V plus G, um, one microgram per ml. Um, and then also um, V plus G, five micrograms per ml. You can see that there's um, a little bit better killing there. Um, and so against MRSA and against um, other gram-positive organisms, um, we know that um, vancomycin doesn't kill very quickly. If you compare that to vancomycin against MSSA, you can see that um, vancomycin isn't very appreciably better than um, in terms of killing, uh, unless you add genomycin to the in vitro system. And so vancomycin um, by itself is not probably the best um, to use. Um, and so it'd probably be better to use a beta-lactam. All right. Um, But usually the kids, for some reason, the kids know when there's only one or two they're all off dead. They are, for the most part. They have something in their mind that clicks, like mom's the only person or dad's the only person. Okay, so you're having trouble hearing me, is that correct? Let me see. Okay, so maybe I just have to be closer to the microphone. Okay, um, so um, let me go ahead and then Continue. Um, let me see. Okay. All right. So, um, why don't we go ahead and talk about um, pharmacokinetics then? Um, and so, um, in terms of absorption, then um, IV obviously is the most common route. Um, oral can be given for pseudomembranous colitis, but um, you don't get any absorption orally, um, except in premature neonates. Um, if they develop um, necrotizing enterocolitis, you may get some cross um, from the uh, membrane, um, the GI tract into the systemic circulation. And we don't like to give it IM. So traditionally, in terms of distribution then, it truly is more of a two compartment model drug in, for pharmacokinetics than 
a one compartment model drug. And so that actually becomes important when you're dealing with um, your pharmacokinetic manipulations. Um, and if you um, base everything based on a one compartment model, um, it'll there'll be some error associated with that. So you'll just have to take that into consideration. So the alpha phase is about um, a half to an hour after the infusion. And then the beta phase is all dependent primarily on renal elimination. Um, and the volume of distribution is um, basically a little bit above total body water. And so kids um, have more water than adults um, and neonates have more than kids. So here's an example of an alpha phase and you can see that after the drug is um, done in freezing, and you're starting to see some changes in the um, alpha phase for distribution. Um, and then the beta phase basically is your elimination phase. And primarily the only thing that's um, affecting elimination is kidney function. Um, so you don't have to worry about um, absorption or distribution during that particular phase. Um, so in terms of um, body fluids and tissues, it goes pretty well into a lot of different tissues and compartments. Um, and if you have to give the drug to the CNS, um, there's really minimal um, distribution across the blood-brain barrier. This can be increased when you have actual meningitis, when the meninges are inflamed. But traditionally, that's not something you have to worry about um, in, if you're not dealing with an inflamed uh, or an infection in the CNS. So here's um, basically a table um, that I got from the pharmacokinetic textbook um, that basically looks at different um, concentrations and sometimes after concentrations. Um, and you can see um, very good concentrations throughout um, the body. Um, if you give the drug orally, um, you can see very high concentrations um, in um, the stool, um, which is good for C. diff, obviously. Um, and um, also, you don't get very good absorption um, when you give it orally. Um, you can see that um, one reference basically saw only um, one microgram per ml um, for um, children. Um, and so that's something that um, is important. Additionally, um, if you just look at the urine concentration, um, you know, very high concentrations in the urine. Um, and so um, that's um, where it all uh, eliminates. So that's something that's um, good to keep in mind. Looking at other different areas, you can see um, um, fairly good concentrations um, amongst the plasma as well as the tissue concentrations. And so there is some um, higher concentrations in the tissue as compared to the plasma. And so if you're dealing with a pneumonia, um, certainly you can see um, high concentrations in the lungs um, as well as um, in the kidney tissue itself. Um, so metabolism, we usually like to think of as clinically insignificant. Um, and so uh, elimination is almost 98% um, renal. And so a lot of times some of the things that are important um, has to do with whether or not patients are getting dialysis or not dialysis. And so dose supplementation may not be necessary. It depends on whether or not you're using a high flux dialyzer or a, a normal membrane. 
And that's something the dialysis nurses should be able to tell you whether they're dealing with one of those two um, dialyzers. So here's um, a pharmacokinetic uh, description or depiction uh, of a patient um, that with normal renal function, and you can see the two compartment model associated with that. And then um, after a patient received one gram, um, you can see for somebody with end-stage renal disease, there's um, limited amount of drug that gets um, eliminated because their kidneys are not functioning very well. You can see all the way out to 48 hours, there's really no difference between the eight hour concentration and the 48 hour concentration. Um, and so that um, can make an impact in terms of how you dose the drug when patients are off dialysis. Um, and so that's probably where that can come into effect. So let's talk about adverse reactions and um, some therapeutics um, and then dosing and some calculations. So um, ototoxicity is something that can occur. Um, obviously, it's really difficult to detect clinically. Um, it has been associated with elevated trough concentrations. And there's some um, controversy in terms of whether or not um, peak concentrations um, have any effect uh, associated with ototoxicity. Uh, nephrotoxicity can occur. Um, you can see um, um, five percent, uh, roughly, or um, up to up to probably eight percent for nephrotoxicity um, associated with the um, trough concentrations. Um, synergy for nephrotoxicity can occur when patients get aminoglycosides along with vancomycin. Um, and even if they're, even if you're doing genomycin for synergy for staph aureus or enterococcus or something. And so that's something that, that you need to keep in mind. Um, and at least at my institution, some of the physicians um, shy away from using vancomycin and genomycin um, just because of that. Um, and we know that um, serum creatinine is a good indirect measure of creatinine clearance. And creatinine clearance is an indirect measure of GFR, which it basically is um, what's needed for um, vancomycin elimination. So um, red man syndrome can occur. Um, that's all based primarily on histamine release. Um, several, probably about 25 years ago, um, we had um, an OR nurse um, actually push vancomycin um, for, a, um, I think, a 12-year-old who got into a motor vehicle accident and had a head injury. Um, and so she pushed the vancomycin and um, the kiddo basically dropped his blood pressure and got all um, bright red. Um, and so they had to cancel the surgery on that particular day. Um, and um, they drew some blood and they um, analyzed it for vancomycin and his um, vancomycin concentration about 30 minutes after pushing the drug was over 100. And so certainly that's something that, that we don't recommend um, anybody doing anymore. Um, rash can occur. Um, there have been some patients who are allergic to vancomycin. It's a very small percent of the entire population, and so you may not run into this um, very often. Um, Low-grade fever or um, something that can occur. Um, patients can complain of thrombophobitis um, or pain on infusion. Um, and that's usually in patients that are receiving vancomycin for um, prolonged um, therapies for 
endocarditis or osteomyelitis or something like that. And then thrombos thrombocytopenia can occur. And so we recommend um, patients receive um, CBC determinations weekly during their um, long-term therapies just to avoid um, any of that. So in 2009, there was a um, consensus review of vancomycin therapeutic drug monitoring. And the recommended target trough concentrations were 15 to 20. And this was primarily to improve tissue penetration um, and increase the probability of obtaining optimal target serum concentrations and improve clinical outcomes. Um, this was a level 3B recommendation, and so it was all based on expert opinion. Um, there wasn't any studies um, demonstrating um, a trough of 15 to 20 was better than a trough of um, 10, let's say. Um, and so it was all based on expert opinion. And this was the first study published in 2004 where patients um, received um, vancomycin and were optimized for an AUC over MIC of greater than 400. Um, you can see that in those patients that um, got an AUC over MIC over 400, their um, ability to clear their infection um, was significantly improved compared to patients who had an AUC over MIC that was less than 400. And so um, this was the first study that linked a pharmacodynamic parameter with an efficacy parameter. Um, and so um, originally um, in 2009, um, concentrations of 15 to 20 for trough was to optimize an AUC over MIC greater than 400. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that. So this is a um, Monte Carlo simulation of 5,000 patients that were given um, a gram every eight hours. Um, and you can see if you modify or if you um, change the um, um, renal function associated with this, you can see that even at a concentration of 10, you're still having a fair number of patients who have a vancomycin AUC greater than 400. So 15 to 20 for a trough concentration um, doesn't necessarily ensure that you're going to get a trough greater than 400. Um, you actually might get, you might overshoot and you might get a trough that's higher than that. And so um, just be aware that um, 15 to 20 may not be the most appropriate um, the interval or um, serum concentration that you want to design um, for your patient. So in terms of dosing, we always dose 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Um, and it's usually every 12 to 24 hours, depending on renal function and age. So obviously the older people, the elderly people in their um, 70s and 80s, um, they may need a regular dose, 15 milligrams per kilogram, but they only need it once a day, every 24 hours. Uh, and that's because um, their renal function is reduced compared to a, a normal, healthy 30-year-old patient. Um, and so um, a lot of the dosing is, is going to be based on what you want your concentrations to be and the site of the infection. So if you have a patient with meningitis, you might want to go on the higher side of the dosing because you need to get that drug across the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so that's only gonna occur by osmosis. So if you have a high concentration in your central um, circulation, and a low concentration in your CNS, 
you have to actually push the drug across the blood brain barrier by osmosis. And so sometimes for patients with um, meningitis, we might go 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. But um, most of the time, 15 milligrams per kilogram will work for patients based on actual body weight. Um, and so um, certainly there's a lot of different ways to estimate your AUC or to calculate your AUC. Um, I know that Jackie sent out a um, Excel sheet um, that basically can predict what your AUC will be uh, based on your demographics of your patient, as well as you can actually put in a trough concentration and it'll actually do your calculations for you. And so I would go ahead and use that and ensure that it predicts very fairly well for your patients um, before you start using it for everybody. So certainly um, software um, is the most accurate method for predicting serum concentrations, and it's the most accurate method then that will um, predict your AUC. However, um, some people don't have the opportunity to, to get a Bayesian software system. Um, and so hopefully the um, Excel sheet that um, Jackie sent out will um, offer some um, advantages for instead of having to do your calculations for yourself. Um, additionally, one of the things that you have to look or you have to be aware of is the um, variability associated with the different automated susceptibility testing systems that are out there. And so for the most part, broth micro dilution is the standard that everything is compared to. So broth micro dilution MIC basically is the standard and then you have these different um, commercially available susceptibility testing devices. So if you have a micro scan at your hospital or a Vitec system, or if you use the e-test system, you can see that there's some variability um, associated with the different MICs. So for example, if your organism MIC is one, um, so here you can see that 25 to 70% of the time, your micro scan will actually show that it's one. So the broth micro dilution says it's one, but sometimes it won't be one by your automated system. It may say that it's um, two, or it may say that it's um, 0.5. Um, additionally, um, if you just go and look at the Vitec 2 system, you can see that there's a 41% agreement between the broth micro dilution and the Vitec 2. And so um, whenever you're dealing with the, with the MIC, you have to realize that there's always some um, variability associated with that particular um, value that is um, obtained from the um, system that's being used at your institution. So um, an AUC of 400 to 600 should be the goal for um, vancomycin. If you have a patient that has an MIC that's close to two, um, say, it's, say your e-test says it's 1.5 or it's um, close to two, let's say it's two, um, then you're gonna probably need to use a different drug um, because the vancomycins, in order to get an AUC of 400, if your MIC is two, you actually need an AUC of 800. And so it's very difficult to get that um, when you have um, uh, the high MICs. And so it might be better to use um, daptomycin, uh, linazolid, or septaroline in those particular instances. That's again probably um, MRSA only. Um, 
in hemodialysis, um, it's best to supplement after each dialysis session with approximately 10 milligrams per, per kilogram because that will replace what's removed by the dialyzer, by the dialyzer membrane. And this is principally if you're using a high flux dialyzer. Um, and so most people get um, dialyzed for hemodialysis like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And so there's always one dialysis session that has a three day um, wait time before their next dialysis session. And so you probably should increase that last dose um, by 25% um, to account for that um, Friday to Monday dialysis session. And then that way you're pretty much um, covered um, for that dialysis until the next dialysis session. In patients that require CRRT, um, vancomycin clearance approximate the um, ultrafiltrate flow rate. Um, and so if um, you ask the dialysis nurse, um, what's the flow rate? Um, you can basically then um, add or then multiply that and basically you can use that dose to, to supplement or to replace um, the amount of drug that's being eliminated um, by CRRT. Um, so obviously then um, you wanna make sure that your drug is working. So a lot of times we put people on vancomycin uh, empirically um, because we don't know what's causing the infection. Um, and so most people like to draw or like to schedule a trough concentration after the fourth dose. Um, and sometimes that's before you make a decision or the, the team has made a decision that they're gonna continue the vancomycin. And I see this a lot at our center where people get vancomycin concentrations the result comes back and the drug is discontinued. So um, usually what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that the drug is gonna be continued or that the, the organism is um, um, a MRSA strain that is being, uh, it's being used for. So um, it doesn't hurt to wait and make sure that the drug is gonna be used um, for a, a period of time um, to treat this infection um, before you get a, a concentration if, if that's what um, is the um, option. Um, vancomycin concentrations are probably um, very inexpensive to run, but the patient gets charged a lot of money. Um, and so um, that's something that you, you need to keep in mind um, when scheduling um, concentrations. Um, so obviously we wanna make sure that um, patients aren't receiving any, um, or aren't uh, developing any adverse events associated with the drug. Um, obviously um, acute renal failure, um, severe or prolonged hypotension will change your renal perfusion. Um, and so um, those are things that um, usually you can anticipate that their renal function is going to go down because of that. Um, patients that get um, other concomitant nephrotoxic drugs, um, we probably need to keep track of those people um, more um, avidly than patients who are not receiving nephrotoxic drug. And then if your pump function doesn't work very well, um, obviously you can have um, reduced um, perfusion to your kidneys just because of heart failure. So with that, I think I'll um, offer any, open it up and see if anybody has any questions. No questions or...
Hello, this is Scott Conklin from San Juan Regional. Hi. So last fall we um, started trying to do uh, AUC calculations to um, for our vancomycin dosing, and I'm not sure what program we're using. We are using an online program, um, but what I found with this particular program is um, even with an AUC to MIC of four to six hundred. Um, our trough levels, we still are drawing trough levels, are coming back significantly lower. So would you, do you ignore the trough levels at that point and just do the AUC to MIC and see how the patient's doing? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So um, just, as this, just as the slide um, showed, um, let me pull it up here for you. So this particular slide, you can have patients that are, le are more than 400 for their AUC and have their trough concentrations be less than 15 to 20, all right? So um, not necessarily do you um, need to make a lot of, um, I guess I would. I guess I would have to say that um, if your AUC is in the range you want, then I would keep it there. I would base it most on the AUC, not the trough. Thank you. Um, second part to that: Do you still draw troughs then, or do you just live with the AUC to MIC and then patient response? Um, yeah, what's, I think what the new vancomycin monitoring guidelines are going to say is that we should draw, we should go back to peaks and troughs um, to help you um, do your AUC calculation um, because drawing just a trough concentration, there's some inherent variability in the calculation, the AUC calculation with just a trough concentration. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? No other questions? Then I'll, um, you, you can certainly email me if you want. Um, it's um, just to stash at creighton.edu. Um, if, or if you want me to um, talk on the phone with you, I'd be happy to do that. Um, just let me know if, if you're having any difficulties or if you, um, want some additional help and I'll try to try to do that.